Hello friends of .NET, I'm Emil Landwerf and you can find me on Twitter at Parajobs. In this episode we are going to implement procedures, uh, that is we will be able to take a region of code, put it uh, in a function, give that guy a name, and then also be able to, uh, to pass arguments to it, um, and then, you know, basically run the code. Uh, so basically something you have probably done a million times. So the one thing we will not be handling today is uh, what's called as functions. Um, and basically, you, in order to pull off functions, you have to control, you have to basically verify that the control flow of your method always produces a value. And so this is something we will tackle next week because that requires a little bit more infrastructure for us to actually compute the control flow graph and you know, walk it in some sensible fashion. But today we will lay the foundation in order to do uh, functions in general. So that is we have to rethink the way we do binding in our program because right now we just have statements and statements are effectively just top to bottom. But with functions you have to you know, answer some interesting questions. For example, you have to decide do you have to do the C style forward declarations? In other words, can you only call functions when they were already declared earlier in the file? Or do you more have the JavaScript or you know, modern language uh, semantics similar to C sharp where the order of declarations doesn't really matter because the way the compiler works is it reads all source files, it declares all types, it declares all members, and then it actually walks through the method bodies. So by the time the method body is evaluated, uh, or I should say bound by the compiler, uh, the symbol table is already logically at least set up entirely so that you can, uh, you know, you basically know that if you can't find a method, it literally doesn't exist. Uh, or if you can't find a type, it literally doesn't exist. So that's something that we will uh, tackle for today. I also have my to-do list here on the side. Um, let me actually verify that everything is live. It seems like YouTube is working as far as I can tell. Um, And then I think we are off to the races. Maybe. <laughs> Funny how the emoji keyboard pops up on the different screen. Alrighty, so let me pull up my notes. So first things first. Um, yeah, so I have a few pull requests that I want to go through because some of them are actually fairly non-trivial and interesting, so I, I want to take some moment to actually walk through them and explain them and maybe give my two cents on those. So let's start with this one here, um, which is actually super nice. Um, so in C Sharp, you have this concept of a do while loop. So currently we have just a while loop where you have the condition at the very top and then the loop just spins so long the condition is true. Um, a do while loop works slightly differently where you enter the loop at least once and then you keep going when the condition at the bottom holds. Um, the funny thing is every single time in my programming career where I thought, oh, I use a do while loop, I end up just doing a do, uh, sorry, a while true loop and then I have some if conditions in my method body that actually breaks or continues. Um, so I don't know, like to me do while loops have never been super useful. but. That's not the point here. The point here is how would you go about doing that? And so, um, actually let me go back here. What is this fellow's name? Um, probably a butcher it. Fede, Fede? Uh, <laughs> basically what, what you see here is um, all the work that needs to happen to basically add a singular control flow construct to our compiler kernel. So there are some tests, that is awesome. Um, and then we basically have a new do while statement, um, which of course we have to bind, in which case we just bind the statement, we bind the expression, turn a new thing. Um, this is our representation for this. Uh, there's no enum kind for this. Um, the rewriter has to handle that. Rewriting is we rewrite, re re rewrite the statement, rewrite the expression. Um, and then they're the same, return the note. And then code generation is similar. Uh, 
That's interesting. I'm not entirely sure where this comes from. I guess it's just that these labels here are not used at all. So we might as well remove them. And then, yeah, do while is rewritten to continue body, go to true condition, continue. That makes sense. All right, so I would think this is awesome. Yeah, here's another small one, which, uh, yeah, I'm on stream, apparently terrible at picking names. <laughs> Maybe also in real life, I don't know. Um, so effectively, when I declared the call expression syntax, I called it parameter, but not parameters, which would be more logical because usually you have more than one, or at least you can have more than one. So it's a collection, so we probably should not have used the singular. So this seems to um, just do that, which is a great. Cleanup change. Let's do that. <laughs> All right, so what else? Yeah, so this one is more interesting. So we have to think about this a little bit more. So this is from Lucas. So currently what we do is we have a symbol table, which is a very fancy way to say we have a dictionary for our symbols. And we have currently two different ones. So if you look at the source code, um, bound scope. So we have a dictionary for variables, we have a dictionary for our functions. What this means is that we effectively have different namespaces for functions and uh, variables. In other words, you can totally declare a function and a variable with the same name because when we, when we bind them, what we know is that we are looking for a variable or a function. So Lucas is demonstrating this here. I can have a, a local variable called print and then I, can case, then I can say print print and it you know, does what you would expect. But from a language standpoint, is that really desirable? Do we really want to be able to have variables and functions, you know, be different symbol tables or do we just rather have things like this where when you say oh if you declare print you just shadow the the function and so if you now try to call the function it just says well that doesn't work um, that is kind of um, an interesting one I'm more or less a fan of this because I think from a language standpoint I don't think it makes sense especially when you imagine you have languages where you can have lambdas or you know, functions as values effectively, in which case there really is no difference between a variable that just points to a function versus an actual function. So um, it would be highly confusing if, you could, um, if there would be different namespaces, um, especially because it would be very hard to differentiate it syntactically afterwards. So I think that's a, that's a good change. I'm not entirely sure I like the error messages though, because uh, if it says function print doesn't exist, well, that's confusing. You should really say print is not a function, right? I, I know what print is, but this ain't a function. So maybe the error message should be slightly be better here. Um, but let's not block the good thing because it's not perfect yet. All right. Sweet, now let's pull down all the changes we have. Which now probably also means I have to close VS Code again, because I tend to have uh, issues with my IntelliSense every single time I did a pull.
And yeah, turns to passing. All right, so the one thing that I want to do already from last time, so we have a few cases where we convert stuff. Um, so we have the bind conversion, and we have this thing called the bind expression, where we say we already know what type this guy has to evaluate to. So this is usually when you say, you know, you bind a loop condition, for example, you know that this thing needs to be of type bool. Um, So the question is when we say bind conversion, how is this different from bind expression? Okay, we have an expression, we have a type. First bind the expression, then we classify this guy. If the conversion doesn't exist, it's an error. Yeah, so I think here's a few things we should probably do. Um, yeah, that's not helpful, is it? Um, cannot convert. Yeah, so this is the... And then we have the other one, cannot convert. And we have this guy here, all right. I think what we want to do here is we probably want to apply the same logic we have here. Because if I bind this expression, this guy can also be of type error. So in which case, I don't want cascading errors, right? So I should say if Maybe we do it here. We say if expression type is not type symbol error and type is not type symbol error, Then we produce an error, but either way we return a bound error expression. Right, that seems reasonable. And then we can say uh, cannot convert. So this should just be return bind conversion from basically target type, comma syntax. Okay, the sign cannot convert. Interestingly enough, when we say bind conversion, the one thing we should also handle So if expression type 
is type return expression. You know what? How about we do this here? If conversion is identity, return expression. Right, identity conversions are basically when the type is the same. That's the way we have defined it. Um, which now means I can basically always call mine conversion and then uh, either the expression already has the type, in which case we just return the expression, or we have to insert a conversion expression into the tree. The only thing I don't like is I don't think I like the order of arguments. So let's actually do it the other way around. And now I probably have to fix up some call sides. And then we say, yeah, this is that. So, cannot, no. Cannot convert. Let's see what else does not do that. Um, okay, da, 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 var converted expression is bind conversion from, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so the one thing we probably want is we also want this guy, extract method. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. Introduce local. Really? Um, call this the diagnostic span. And then we can do this, right? We could say, this is now a general method we can use, bind conversion. Yeah, what's a little bit painful is that I cannot change the order of parameters in VS Code. But we probably want the diagnostic span first. And then the expression. And then the type. Right, in which case I should be able to say converted expression is, well, syntax expression span, bound expression, and variable dot type. All right, now we only have one place where we report cannot convert. So all these guys are effectively centralized. So Nimi is asking, should there be a bound node for a conversion, whether it's implicit or explicit? Yes, uh, because whether it's implicit or explicit is effectively a language decision. In other words, there is a conversion happening at runtime. It just is invisible in the source code. It just is automatic. So very simple example is you have a variable of type int. 
and you have a variable of type float, uh, so you can totally assign the float, sorry, the int to the float. Um, so it's implicit, so in source code you don't see a conversion, but at runtime you do need to make a conversion because they're different data types, right? So they have different representations in memory, they're both 32-bit, but they look different. So yes, the bound tree has to have the node in it, otherwise, you know, <laughs> we only emit code for what's in the bound tree. So if there's no representation for that, it wouldn't happen. However, this is not, a, this is not the check whether it's implicit. Identity means is the type literally the same type? So when you look at the way we classify conversions, we are saying if the from type is the to type, then we say identity, right? And then we would say, you know, if the from type is in, then the target type is float, let's say we would say implicit, right? Implicit conversions are different from identity conversions. Identity conversions are literally, it's the same. It's the same type. Um, I hope that answers that. We do have a representation for a conversion. It's basically this one here, bound conversion node, where we just record effectively the expression and the target type. All right, so why all of the setup? Um, well, I want to introduce a concept in our language. Um, so I want to be able to do stuff like this, where you can say, var x string equals hello. So basically I want to introduce the notion of optional typing, right? So you can omit the type, in which case it's inferred, or you can add the type, in which case that is the type of the variable. So in order to do this, we need some representation for this. Um, it starts with, I don't think we pass a colon today. That is correct, there is no colon. So let's add this guy here. That would be the colon token. Boom, ba -dum, boom, boom. Okay, so actually, I should probably commit what I currently have, just because that's already a very logical chunk of work we have done. Um, we would say this is um, centralized. Bind, uh, binding conversions. Uh, and of course, I should have uh, set out a branch for this. This would be episode 12. Let's create the branch. Uh, we call this episode 12, declaring functions. Um, right, here we go. Mm, let me guess. Let me guess, let me guess, uh, reset, yes, of course. I said I only want to commit part of the change, but then I ended up committing everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I don't want to commit the Lexa changes yet. All right, so let's do this again, commit. Um, Yeah, I did commit uh, centralized binding conversions. It's 
funny how your brain thinks it's doing one thing and then you're actually doing um, the other thing. All right, so we have this guy. So now we have um, the ability to declare commas. I probably have to go to syntax facts and actually say when somebody asks for one of those guys, I forgot what we have first comma and then no colon comma. All right, so that means colon. That is the no the other way around. Somebody asked for the colon token. We return a colon token. Um, let's see whether that runs test. Good job. <laughs> Coffee everywhere. It's almost like I'm doing Java. Um, all right, so we have this guy. Now what we need to do next is in the parser, or maybe not in the parser, maybe I need a different thing first. So what I need to introduce is the notion of a type clause. Let's call this the type clause syntax. And that is effectively um, just a colon. So it would be a syntax token, colon token, and it would be followed by the uh, by a syntax token uh, identifier. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And this guy returns a syntax kind um, type clause. This guy would go where the generic nodes are, somewhere there. Let's move this to a separate file. Right, now we have to parse this. So where would this go? Well, when we parse a variable declaration, uh, we would say identifier. And here we would say type clause. We would say that would be parse optional type clause. And that returns a type clause. And we would basically say if the current kind is not syntax kind colon token, Return null. Otherwise, return parse type clause. And then we would say var colon token is match token syntax kind colon token. And then we would say identifier token call this identifier. And then we say return new type class syntax for colon or identifier. Right? Right. And then, of course, the type clause is going into our variable. Declaration syntax, so we add the parameter. And of course, we have to add the property. So now we say keyword identifier type clause equals token. All right, that seems very reasonable. Yeah, so Nimi is saying maybe types should have their own syntax not to be future proof in case you ever add more complicated types like generics, arrays, tuples, or union types, etc., or simply dotted names as opposed to single keyword always. Um, totally true. Um, the problem is, if you do language design, it's actually not trivial to have syntax nodes where the API is very stable. 
you would effectively have to be super conservative in your language choices and also in your API choices. I think right now I'm not feeling uh, that this is necessary because we're still you know, in the middle of making the compiler bare bones work. So I don't care right now about our API. And so, yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing the point, to be honest. But yes, I think it's a very good point that, um, generally speaking, we probably need to handle more things than just keywords. All right, so right now, it actually should already uh, work. It just shouldn't do anything. So we should be able to do that. So we should be able to say var name is string, and we should be saying hello. Yes, that works. Of course, right now, the we completely ignore whatever we put here. I mean, I can put here blah, 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 blah. That's fine. I can even put here, you know, nonsensical types, and that's also fine. Um, so of course, we need to handle this in the binder now, which shouldn't be super hard. So all we have to do here in binding is we would say bind variable declaration somewhere. Bind variable declaration, yeah, that like guy. Um, we would say var type, and we would say bind type clause, syntax type clause. And say this is a type symbol. We would say if syntax is null, return null, otherwise, do we anywhere say bind type? We don't have any types? Nah, that can't be right. Well, I guess it is right. The first time we actually introduced the notion of types to the syntax. Is that actually true? <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. Do we even have a lookup type? Yeah, we do have a lookup type. So lookup type for syntax uh, identifier text, uh, var type. No, it's clearly not the case because we have casts, right? It is clearly not the case. Find our references, where is it? I don't produce an error. That's right. So there's no notion right now of you have a type name that is incorrect. So this is the first thing where we actually do this. Okay, we would say if type is null, we would say um, diagnostics report undefined type for this span probably and probably the text as well. Turn not, otherwise return type, well, or. <laughs> Um, undefined token, undefined binary, undefined name. Somewhere here. Um, undefined type. So you would say blah, blah, blah. Report undefined. There you go. That's the one. Undefined type. Type name doesn't exist. Var variable type. So that would be if type is null, or if type is not null, 
Well, I guess it's just this, right? Um, Converted initializer would be bind conversion for variable type um, and the initializer. Well, I guess the other way around, right? And then apparently I have to say syntax span, no, syntax initializer, initializer. Will be the one we want to report the error on, and then we would say the initializer is the converted initializer. Does that make sense? I think it does. Let's see what happens. So why not return an error type? Um, good question. Um, our message is okay. That worked. That shouldn't work. Yes. Um, Yeah, that's a good point, actually. So what's happening here is that this is actually not a bug. That's actually kind of expected behavior. So right now, the way we deal with conversions is that I just end up calling convert you know, to int or to string or whatever. And so for cases where the, these things cannot be converted, right now we don't have a, you know, any sort of error handling in our language. So basically, the program just crashes when the number is not actually a number. And the reason this is compiling is because right now we are saying, well, just convert this expression to this type. And you can convert a string to an int. It's just, it's an explicit conversion. So we should probably say that um, in this case, the, we, we only want to convert implicit conversions. So we probably should say bind conversion needs to know whether explicit conversions are okay or not. Um, so how would we do that? Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. So we can say bool allow explicit would default to false and then who is calling this guy the bind conversion okay so this guy yes and This guy would say, uh, uh, allow explicit false uh, true, actually. But that doesn't help us because this method actually does not take this. So we probably have to do the same thing here. Right. And then I think we can even simplify this more. But 
and bind variable expression no declaration right bind variable declaration So this should now not compile. No, it should be allow explicit because implicit should always work, right? The only thing I don't want to always make actually didn't of course handle this thing. So we say bind conversion, um, go here. So allow explicit, we usually don't allow explicit conversions. We only would allow implicit conversions. So we would say if, uh, yeah, maybe we should say if not allow explicit and conversion is explicit, um, then we would say Um, cannot convert and maybe we just say cannot convert. Hmm. Implicitly. Cannot convert implicitly. I mean, we could do the same thing we do in C sharp, right? Where basically we say an error message like, um, where is it by? No, um, report cannot convert. Uh, we would say cannot, well, cannot convert an explicit conversion exists. Are you missing a task? Is that what C sharp says? Oh, it's in parentheses. Bit odd, but fine. All right, this would be from type to type. Yeah, this would be spam. Let's try this again. Yeah, <laughs> I am seemingly not typing well. Uh, exists. Here we go. So now we save our message int equals blah 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 cannot convert type string to int implicit conversion exists are you missing a cast all right so this is kind of where we wanted to land Any questions on this so far? Yeah, the code fix to insert the cast, yes. <laughs> um, allow variables to have optional types. All right, so. Now let's talk about procedures. Where would we do this? So maybe before we go into the syntax, because the syntax is the least of our concerns, uh, let's talk about how binding currently works. So 
the way the program right now is executed is that effectively I call this function here bind global scope, uh, bind global scope. And that gives me effectively access to the previous scope. And the previous scope in our world is because we're in the environment of a REPL where we have previous submissions, is basically whatever you wrote before, right? So you have this chain of earlier submissions. And if a submission doesn't compile, then it's not, you know, added to the chain, if you will. So at any given point in time, all the previous ones are, you know, compiled correctly. And so the compilation syntax is basically the current submission and then the previous is whatever it was before. And then basically all we have to do, because our compilation syntax right now only holds a single statement, all we have to do here is uh, just bind the one statement, right? So if we now extend this to functions or procedures, whatever you want to call them, um, we have to think about what our compilation unit model will be like. So we probably won't have a singular statement. We'll probably have a collection of some sort of top level item. And there's really two things. It's either a function declaration or it's a global statement. Right? And then you could say in a REPL environment, you know, any expression is also a valid global statement. But if you actually have a real program where you have multiple files on disk and you compile them, we could decide that the only things that are legal at the global level are variable declarations, um, but not uh, arbitrary statements. And then we would just say one of the functions has to be the main method. I think that's probably a pretty reasonable approach. And then if you go down that path, then okay, so our compilation unit is now multiple functions. And what we then do is we don't want to bind immediately all the function bodies. We will do a first pass where we declare all the functions. And then we will say, okay, now work for each method body and now bind the statement. So that means the order in which the functions are declared um, doesn't matter because forward declarations are not great to work with. And uh, if you ever worked with C or C++, it's annoying as hell if you have to declare functions twice, like you know, in the source file and then another time in the header file so that people can actually call it. And then of course you have all sorts of interesting, interesting uh, you know, issues when you rename parameters and blah, 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 you have to do everything twice. All right, so let's work on the compilation unit first. So let's say we have, first of all, this global concept. So let's say there is a, how do we call this? Let's just call this member syntax because I don't feel like putting compilation unit in front of it. But logically, it's, it's um, whatever you can put in a file, right? And then we would have two derivatives. We would have a global statement syntax. That would be a member syntax. And that would just be holding on to a statement syntax. Of course, this would be a sealed class. And then we would say this is a global statement, syntax kind global statement. And then we would say another kind of a member syntax would be a function declaration syntax. And of course, that is very different. And we call this function declaration. All right, let's start with these guys. Again, these go kind of here, kind of sensible. All right, so what is the function declaration going to look like? Well, we have a syntax token for the function keyword. 
we would have the actual function name. So it would be the syntax token identifier. We would have um, a syntax token, yeah, parenthesize syntax. I am not great at typing things. <laughs> uh, and uh, let's do not expression syntax, but let's say it's a separated syntax list of uh, parameter syntax, which we don't have yet. Or we will add that, and there will be parameters. And then, of course, we would have a type clause, which would be the type of the um, the whole function. That seems do it again. Parameters. Um, da, 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 da. So let's add a public sealed class parameter syntax. That will be a, a syntax node. And that would be syntax kind of parameter. And the parameter would be a syntax token identifier and a type clause. Something like this. This also goes somewhere here. Actually, I think this makes maybe a little bit more sense organizationally. All right. Oh yeah, and then of course this guy is now an immutable array of members um. so no local functions um we don't have them right now i don't plan on adding them um but you could trivially do that in the same way that I do the global statement, you can just introduce a statement node that you call local function uh, statement, which basically would be of type statement and it just holds a function declaration. So you can totally, similar to all these other things work, right? I have, an, I have a statement uh, called expression statement that holds an expression, right? So you can always repurpose part of the hierarchy into another thing by just adding a placeholder around it. So we can, this wouldn't be hard to do syntactically. All right. So now we have all of those guys. So now how do I actually commit this? Um, I probably should have I'm oh, not committing. Um I probably should have done the the fix ups first. So if, okay, so when we say bind statement that no longer works. And then yeah, our parser of course. Yeah, maybe do this first. Maybe say members, and we call this parse members. So 
Okay, so this is an immutable array of type in member syntax. Um, um, yeah, where do we have this guy already? Didn't we have something like this? Yes. Let's do something like this. Let's call this members. That would be member syntax. Right? And then the return is just return members to immutable. And we keep going until end of file. Actually, that is a very good point. So we probably need to do the same trick here. So if parse statement do not consume any tokens, we need to skip the current token and continue in order to avoid an infinite loop. We probably want to keep doing this. Um, so now we can say var mem, um, okay, if current kind is, uh, Actually, you know what? Let's call this parse member. Um, okay. And there will be a member syntax. And we would say if current kind is syntax kind uh, function keyword. Function keyword. Um, then we would say return parse function declaration. Else we would say return parse global statement. I would say a global statement would be var statement is parse statement. And then we say return new uh, global statement syntax for this statement. And um, yeah, this one we have to do something for. First, we need to add the keyword. Um, that would be probably here, right? Function keyword. Um, and then I think the only thing we have to do is in the syntax facts, um, we would have to add that entry here. We would say function keyword function. And then I think, yeah, we would have to do this here as well. Now where is this? Yeah. All right, so now we can actually detect our function keywords. All right, the function keyword would be match token, syntax token, no, syntax kind, function keyword. We would say identifier is the same thing, right? Um, identifier. Now, what is this? Uh, uh, parenthesis expression. Damn it. <laughs> I am lazy. Um, we would 
let's say this is the open parenthesis token. Um, we would say this is the close parenthesis token. Parameters, I would say this is parse uh, parameter list. Um, uh, type, of course, uh, would be parse optional type class. And then, of course, the body is parse block statement. And then we would say return new function declaration syntax for the function keyword, the identifier, the open parenthesis, the parameters, the close parenthesis, and the type, and of course the body, which for some reason we did not add to the syntax node. Oopsie. What's, what are, I see, what did we mess up? Hmm. What is happening here? Fine, be like that. Let me say this is a separated syntax list for parameter syntax. What is it? Function keyword identify open parenthesis, parameters, close parenthesis. Yes, and hopefully that's at the end, right? Yeah, this is at the end now. All right, so. How do we do arguments? Parse arguments. So that will probably be the same thing, right? Uh, parse parameter. All right, in our case, we want, yes, that is correct, we want this. I would say this is parse parameter, and that would be a parameter syntax. We call this parameter. So we need a type class which is not optional for parameters. And then we say return new parameter syntax for identifier and type. And apparently I misspelled identifier. Of course I did. All right, so far this was just busy work to get the stuff actually into the syntax tree. But hopefully that is clear in terms of where stuff goes. I think open brace token and parse members should be removed. Parse members. Uh, is it uh, parse members? That is correct. Good catch, David, good catch. All right, so now let's cheat. You would now say 
uh, var statement is syntax members of type global statement syntax um, single nah first the default nah I'm not entirely sure how I want to do this to get this running again. So let's think about what the global scope would look like. So the global scope right now has diagnostics for the global scope. It has all the variables and it has the statement. Um, mm -hmm. So who is using this guy? That would be my first question. Um, So we assign it, that's great. Um, ah, yeah, that's right. So as we are building the next scope, Yes, that is true. Yeah, so basically the variables are used to build up the scope for the next submission. I think the way I want to do this is, so first I want to bind all the functions. And by binding the functions, I really mean not binding the body, but just binding the um, the declaration effectively and getting it into the symbol table. Then I should be able to bind all statements, or the global ones. Right. So let's do the following then. Let's say for each var function in syntax members of type function declaration syntax. We would say binder bind function declaration then we can say for each var global statement in syntax members of type global statement syntax and then I could say uh, dun, dun, dun. Uh, the statement equals binder bind statement for global statement It's not going to fly. Uh, we can say var well, functions is binder scope get declared functions. Um, certainly have the diagnostics. And then we would say functions variables expressions. Yeah, that's not going to fly. Now we need effectively our 
statement is immutable array create builder for uh, bound statement if that is there and then we would say well let's say statement builder and then we can just say var um, well statement builder add s and then we can say the statement is actually uh, a new bound block statement for or statement builder to immutable and then we can just say that is the statement Something like that seems reasonable. Okay, let's go. Hopefully this just added the functions. Yeah, it did. Uh, yep. Now we have all the functions. And then I think what I have to do here is I would say for each previous this and same thing here I would say for each uh, what is that uh, functions I declare function yeah. so in principle that is already doing the right thing now let's add the function declaration binding which in our case yeah what do we have to do well So let's start with the parameters. That might be easier. Immutable array, create builder, parameter symbol. I would say for each var um, parameter syntax in function, actually we should probably call this syntax, so that's what we call it everywhere else. Um, syntax dot parameters name is parameter syntax um, identifier text scene parameter names we want to make sure that we don't have duplicates there so that's this if scene add name then we would say diagnostics um, report duplicate or maybe parameter what do we have already declared? Um, symbol already declared. Let's say parameter already declared. We would say that is the parameter syntax. Um, span followed by uh, name maybe. Good enough. Uh, 
probably should need the type, right? So what is this bind type? Clause for parameter syntax type. Then I can say parameter is new parameter symbol for name and for type. And then I can say parameters add parameter. Okay, let's call this parameter type, parameter name. You probably want the type uh, bind type clause for actually in our case bind optional type clause. No, bind type clause that returns now. That would be parameter, no, it would be syntax type clause. And if there's no type specified, in that case I return type symbol void. Right, that's basically what we have most support today. Well, not support. So we could say if type is not type symbol void. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't matter. Actually, eh, mm. let's do it the right way. Let's say diagnostics report. Functions are unsupported. And that would be syntax type. It's bad. So I'm going to nix this guy eventually. So I will just move it all the way to the bottom. And call this functions with return values are unsupported. All right. Uh, let's call this parameter, parameter name is already declared. I should say a parameter where the name is already, um, already exists. Something like that. All right, so now we can declare our function. That would be new function symbol for syntax, uh, what is that? Syntax name, no, syntax identifier dot text, uh, parameters to immutable. And then of course the type. And then we have to say scope try declare variable. No, try declare functions. Try declare function for the function. And if we can't do that, then we would say re uh, diagnostics report function already declared which would be the syntax identifier span. Um, function dot name. Something like that.
I was amazed by where the look, <laughs> the quick fix puts the stuff. Seems like some sort of alphabetically sorted in, but always, it's never the place where you want it. Uh, do we have a variable already declared? How do we do try declare? We put symbol already declared. Ah, okay. Never mind. Function already. We don't need that. All right. So far, so good. So we are binding the function now. So the question is, let's see what happens when we actually try to do some stuff. Okay, compilation unit syntax does not contain a definition for statement. Use statement because we need to exclude the end of file token. So if the text is not empty, then by definition, um, we need to have a member. All right, so this should still work. So we have a compilation unit, which is a global statement, which is the expression statement, which is the expression. Okay, I should be able to say now things like name string. And I should be able to say print pi plus name plus yes so now we have a compilation unit with a function declaration with a function key with an identifier token open parenthesis a parameter an identifier token a type clause close parenthesis token a block statement so that seems Reasonable. Of course, if I now try to do anything, if I say hi, um, it will crash because we have done nothing to evaluate expressions that have functions in there that are not the predefined ones. So, how do we handle that? Well, Let's start by going to the evaluator. And let's think about how we do things right now. So what we have is we have this bag, this global dictionary with all the variables. And that kind of makes sense in cases where we actually have true global variables. But this will probably not work so well as soon as we have functions. So for example, local variables, you really don't want to put in this global thing. Even though each function has its own symbols, so the functions themselves have, don't share any variables, so to speak, um, you have to handle recursion. So if a function calls itself, well then basically the next, you know, the, the, the call goes to effectively a fresh instantiation of the function, if you will. So you need 
they need basically its own dictionary of the local variables, right? Otherwise, you have this problem when you have recursive function calls. You know, the, the, the function you're calling into changes the local variable, and when the function returns, now the parent can observe those variables, even though they're, of course, not the same thing. Um, the way this is implemented in pretty much any operating system or any programming language in this universe is that there's a runtime stack. And so every single time you call a function, you know, there's a stack and the function basically gets space on that stack. And so each local variable, if you will, is, is um, basically within that stack. And so when the function returns, you just pop the stack with the state of the function and then things disappear. So we can do one thing relatively easily, and that is in introducing this notion of a stack of dictionaries. Um, and then our lookup rules for evaluating basically has to first probe the local ones and then the global ones. Something like that. All right, so let's do this. So first of all, let's say we need a stack read only stack of And we call this locals. And there is a, always going to be a local stack. So now when we say evaluate expression statement, and we say variable expression, you basically have to say. If locals count larger than zero, then we say var locals is uh, locals peak. Um, if locals try get value for our variable, out var value, then we say return this one. Otherwise, it must be a global variable. Let's call this globals to just make things clear. Um, Nah, I don't like that. Yeah, doesn't matter. Good enough. All right, so this works for getting something out. We have to do something very similar here. And then we basically have to say if, so we evaluate this guy. And then we say, if you have locals, um, if locals contains, hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? No, I think I don't want to do any of that. Here's what I think I will do. I will say switch v variable because there are basically two cases. There is the um, parameter symbol, no, actually that is also not helpful because local variables are in the same scope. Mm. Yeah, how do I know whether something is a global variable versus a local variable? <laughs> um, that is an interesting problem.
how do I know what global variables are? So this guy basically just gets a dictionary passed, which is basically, here's where you store the state of the global variables. Um, and we could have different symbols, or we could um, have a flag or something that says this is a global variable. What is the most logical way to store that information? Um, I think one thing we can probably do, which is probably the most logical thing to do, and that is changing our symbols slightly. So let's ignore this for now. Let's only handle, okay, so actually, no, we need to, <laughs> we need to pass, how do we pass them? Yeah, let's first get to the point where we can actually say, so this is to do, uh, we need to remember locals in our stack frame, not in the global. Dictionary. I should say store. Um, let's just think about how we actually do the call expression. So if it's a built-in function, we do this. If it's not a built-in function, then we basically have to evaluate all the arguments. Um, uh, no. For our node arguments, I. And then. I have to effectively create a new stack frame. So we would have to say var locals is new uh, parameter sim, uh, new dictionary variable symbol uh, object. Yeah, in fact, that's what I have to do. Forget about that. We just say notes, note arguments, and I would say var value, var parameter is node function parameters i, and then we say locals add parameter, value and then we say globals locals 
push locals. Right, and then we just have to say return evaluate node function, sort of. So the way this currently works is that our root evaluate function is basically this guy here, right? So which is basically, um, we basically say root, it's a block statement. So how about instead of saying root, um, So saying well, a statement would be root boom, boom, boom. Are these the only usages? Looks like it. Uh, let's call this body maybe. And then let's extract the method here. And we call this evaluate statement or evaluate, yeah, something like this. So in our case, we would say the body of the function. So we currently don't have the, the body of the function. Which we have to get first somehow. Which brings us back to the binder because right now we'd never bind function bodies. So that's the next concept we would have to do. We would have to introduce this other thing here where we basically say we have this is the global scope, which is the first step. And then we would say there's another one, let's call this bound program or something. And we call this bind program. And what this guy basically needs is global scope and then basically what we have to do is we would have to say for each of our function in global scope um, there's that function we would say body is Um, bum, 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 bum. Well, binder is new binder. Um, that is an interesting one. Bound scope. I need same here, right? We have the scope which we probably need. But we only need this guy once. And then we say, okay, we need um, parent scope function. So that we know we actually bind a function. And then we can say binder bind statement. And that would be the function um, declaration, which we currently don't have, body var body. Yeah, so when we go to the, so when we declare, so we have this thing, function symbol, right? The function symbol should also have uh, a, sim, no, a function declaration syntax uh, declaration. which is optional. So 
So that means now when we declare these guys, this should actually say, remember where you came from. So now when we bind the statement, we are, this is the function body. And then logically all we have to do is record that. So let's say we have a function bodies, uh, immutable dictionary, create builder for, uh, do, 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 do. function symbol uh, bound block statement and then we would say function bodies add function comma body um, I guess it's bind block statement um, which ironically gives us back about, yeah, actually that is fine because we don't, so the other thing we do here is we don't just bind a statement. I mean, this is what we start with. Um, and then we say lowered body is lower. Lower the body. And then this is guaranteed to be a bound statement at this point. All right, so now we add a parameter to this guy. And we basically say we have a field and we call this guy a function. And so in the context of a function, we know we are in a function. Otherwise function is null. And then this guy would be null. Right? Something along those lines. And then the bound program would be basically those guys. Something like this, new bound program, which we don't have yet, but it would be the global scope. Well, would it be? I mean, oh yeah, we need diagnostics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, diagnostics is global scope, diagnostics. And then we would just say diagnostics, add range, or binder, diagnostics, diagnostics, um, I guess. We can probably do that, right? Then we would say it's a bit odd, I have to say. So the bound program would basically have the same information as the global scope, I guess. Um, which is kind of odd. Maybe I'm overthinking that. Maybe instead of doing that, there's a lot of machinery that is going on right now. Maybe we just combine all of this here in the bind global scope. Yeah, 
Yeah, let's do that. I think that might be easier to understand. I mean, we still have to somehow do all of that, but maybe we can do this here. Okay, bind global statements, and then maybe we have here this thing where we say bind function bodies new diagnostic bag and then we can just say these are all the diagnostics Um, and then we would just say diagnostics and range those guys um, Yeah, I think I've maneuvered myself into an interesting position here where whatever I had in mind earlier was way clearer than, than what we ended up having now. But let's go with this for a second. I don't think I like that. I actually think extracting this into its own step makes a lot more sense. I mean, it's kind of what what if there's no It is a very weird way to do it. Well, yeah, maybe I don't do that. Maybe I just say the diagnostics of these guys and then good enough. And then we just say the diagnostics here just for whatever the method body diagnostics were. In any case, we have the function bodies in here, so that is good enough. And then we just say return bound for them. Let's do that for now. 
I may have to rethink that. I think that wiring is not entirely how I would like to have that. But logically, it's a two-step thing, right? You, you first bind the global scope and then you bind the rest of the program. Um, oh boy. Um, something like that. All right, so now we say, yeah, so let's first get the, the binder in order. Or well, I guess the compiler is probably the closest thing we have. So when we say, uh, oh, where's the compiler? The compilation thingy? It's in the root compilation. So we initialize the bound, the bound scope lazily, we evaluate. So how does that work? So we say, all right, get the diagnostics. If there are any diagnostics in the global one, then we say bad things happen. Um, if that works, then we say var bound, well, let's just say var program. That would be binder bind program, in which case we give you the global scope. And then we say if program diagnostics any, then same thing here. We bail and pass in those diagnostics. What do you want? Oh, you want two immutable range. Um, yeah, we get the lowered statement, okay. And we have an evaluator that basically gets um, some stuff. And so the one thing we need to pass to it is the bound program, oh, sorry, it's the program dot function bodies. Um, and of course the global scope, uh, sorry, the statement. All right, so now this guy gets the, um, oopsie daisy. Oh, we don't want a builder here, right? Um, Probably, let's see, we probably wanted um, function bodies. Yeah. All right, so now that means this guy here should probably have been declared as not a builder, but as an actual immutable data structure, um, which now means in our binder, we have to say to immutable. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it does. Okay, so now this is a very convoluted way to get the data across. We we'll probably have to refactor this eventually. However, we are getting closer to being able to run stuff. So now in order to find the function statement, so we have to say statement is function bodies, try get value. 
Um, no, actually, we don't need to do this. That would be a crash. If we're getting here and we don't know the function, that is not good. What is this thing called? Evaluate statement. That's why I call this. Something like that. Yeah, I think it probably works. All right, so far so good. So now we are back to this one where we would need to know whether it's a local or not. And the nice thing is we actually do know that. So what we could do, we could decide the variable symbol is abstract and it only has two derivatives. It has parameter. Oh, actually, no, sorry. It would have... So this would be a global variable. And then this guy would be a local. What is the easiest way to do that? The most logical way would probably be Good. Let's be explicit with what we have. Let's say we have a global variable, which is this, and it would be a kind of variable symbol. And we would pass on is read only and type. we would have a local variable symbol that would be like that. And then a parameter, we would say is a local variable symbol. And then we would say this is a local variable and this is a, let's call this global variable. And we call this abstract. Oops. Right, we have an abstract variable symbol, a global variable symbol, a local variable symbol. Now let's add this guy. This guy would go global variable, local variable, parameter. All right, so that just means in the binder, when we actually create variables, bind variable. Well, if function is null, that means global variable symbol, with all this data. Otherwise, it means 
local variables and we'll remove all that data. Sure, we like that. And we call this variable symbol. So if we inside of a function, we get this, otherwise we get that. Seems fairly reasonable. Which no means here, I can basically decide So if v variable kind is uh, symbol kind local variable, then I would say return locals. So if it is a parameter or a local variable, then I would get it from there. Otherwise, I get it from there. So same concept here. So we would say if it's a parameter or a local variable, or it can't be a parameter because parameters are read-only, um, then we would say locals equals value fine be like that else it's a global one Well, or we could just say if it's a global variable. If it's not a global variable, I think that might actually be easier to understand. So if we negate this, if it's a global variable, global, otherwise it's a local, we do that. So this is a global variable. Same thing here. Invert. Something like that. Now let's see. Can I create an instance of the abstract class or interface variable symbol? Um, interesting. That I buy. Okay, so let's say let x equals 10. x. All right, that worked. Now let's say function high name is string. And then we say name uh, print high name. Variable name doesn't exist. Yes, that is correct. Parameter text requires a value. Well, 
What? So that is an interesting one. So let's start with the first one. So variable name doesn't exist. Um, that makes sense because we don't declare parameters currently. But the second one is a little bit on the annoying side. Um, let's go to the binder and find out what's going on there. So when we say, this is clearly when we bind a call, bind call expression. Um, so when we go for wrong argument count, and then we say here, yeah, this is probably not what we want. We probably want the uh, parameter, oh, sorry, the syntax. No, it's the parameter. Parameter, no, escape. I'm doing it again. It's the syntax arguments i dot n. Right, so that means if I do this, we should now get an error that only the inner part is read, not the whole method call. What? Did not save. <laughs> yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Okay. Because I'm like, what parameter text requires a variable type string? Okay, that makes more sense now. So the only thing that actually gets an error here is this guy, not the entire method invocation. All right, so, but now more importantly, when we bind a function, um, We basically have to say for each var, I guess, if function is not null, then we say for each var uh, function in, no, p in function parameters, we would have to say scope try declare variable p. which would hopefully solve this problem. All right, now let's see what ends up happening when I say, ta-da, the given key was not present in the dictionary. Evaluate call expression. That's an interesting one. Bind program then. So we say, we do add the function body. Yeah, I suspect what happens is that because they're from a different submission that causes some trouble. Because global scope functions probably only contains the functions that are declared by us right now. Which I don't think is what will work for us.
Yeah, we probably have to walk the whole thing. We can probably say var scope is global scope while scope is not known. And we say scope is scope parent series. And then we say scope functions. Now the problem is we have to now we bind everything multiple times, but that for now I think that's good enough given that we are 50 minutes over. Let's try this again. Okay, this is not helping. Let's try this. Really? Not that that makes a difference, but okay, now I'm really confused. Why would that not work? Well, I guess same thing here. Maybe I didn't save. Seems to be the evergreen. Yes, here we go. The one thing we should test now that recursion works the way we expect it to. Um, count um, number int. Um, let's say if number is zero um yeah i wasn't done yet um in that case we would say um if number is zero then print done um count number minus one print string number uh, Yeah, something like that. We would say else and then we do something like number equals 42, which should be, oh, which we can't do, yeah var x equals number let's do that and then we can say x x minus one x x something like this what oh yeah i don't have semicolons in this language all right so now what does count 10 do? Uh, let's say count three. Precious, hmm, that's funny. Why is that? The given key X was not present in the dictionary. What? Huh? 
How is that possible? Where are we crashing? We are crashing when we're evaluating a call expression. What is happening here? What have I done? With the global variable, globals, otherwise locals. Seems pretty straightforward. If it's a global variable, you enter it in the globals, otherwise you enter it in the locals. Find all references. So who is returning this guy? Only global variables are global variables. Unsurprisingly. Evaluate assignment expression. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Uh, the result equals this guy, and then we have to say locals pop. Otherwise, bad things will happen. And then we say return result. Not sure that solves the problem, but we will find out. Um. Nope. really don't know why this is crashing. So we get the expression here. So clearly looking at this, what's crashing is this guy. So for some reason I can't find X. Which seems odd because clearly oh 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 well clearly I'm going from here to here, right? So that means there's a push somewhere for the locals. X is declared in the local frame. Clearly, I was able to evaluate it here. All right, evaluate, evaluate statement, expression statement, expression. Call expression. Oh, no, 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 no. That call expression calls called statement. Expression, binary expression, expression. No, actually, I'm crashing already here. This is the binary expression where it explodes. That would suggest that we just can't read it from the local scope. So clearly, I have the parameter here.
I enter the parameter in the scope. I call the guy. So clearly you would expect that you would get to the, oh yes, that is right. That is right. Or is it? Yes, I am an idiot. That is what's happening here. The answer is very often, I'm an idiot. So when we declare, when we wait a variable declaration, we have to obviously put it into the scope as well. So we would have to say if um, I guess node variable. Right. Something like that. Right. <clears throat> Interesting. All right. One, two, three, forty-two. And forty-two is just output because we have this last expression kind of thing, uh, which we probably should get rid of as well. Um, but that looks right. So we don't have so if we would have put everything into the global scope, then basically these assignments should mess with the Is that right? We can probably trivially check this. So let's pretend for a moment we don't have local scopes and see what results we would get. Really? Really? Yeah, it's hard to simulate because you would have to do the same thing for parameters, right? You would have to say globals. Um, Uh, we probably would do um, if it's, how about we write this if it's not a parameter So this should be able to simulate this without crashing. 
well. Yes. Yeah, so these are the kind of results you get when you don't track them correctly. So that should conclude this. I think there is some cleanup that we probably have to do next time because I'm not entirely sure I like the way we handle the global scope right now. It's a little bit of a mess. Everything in the evaluator is very sound. I actually like this. Um, there maybe is some room for centralization here. Like extract method, let's call this the sign. And then we can do the same thing here. Assign node variable value. Mm, yes, variable symbol. Probably would move the assign here, and then probably just for eh, no, then. It is fine. So I think the only thing I don't really like is the binder right now. This is a bit of a messy thing, but we will probably change that later. All right, I think that's all I had for today. Uh, let me just commit what we have. Um, allow function data or support, uh, add function declarations. All right, so this is all I had for today. It took me longer than I expected. Um, apparently, I don't, I didn't quite remember how I actually um, walk the method bodies or the function bodies. So probably next time I will clean this up a little bit because it's a bit messy right now. Um, and the next time, the other thing we will take care of is the ability to actually return values. So right now, what we can do is we cannot actually have functions that produce values, right? So the typical thing of like function, you know, add, uh, well, a, b, int, but you would just say int, that would immediately say we don't, we don't have support for that. And so next time you'll actually have to return 
uh, we have to add return statements and um, we would have to uh, verify that all control you know, flow through the function actually produces a value so you don't fall through with no result. So that's the thing we'll focus on next time. And then, um, yeah, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, please leave, leave constructive feedback. But in any case, subscribe so you get the next episodes when they're going out. All right, this is all I had. And then, um, yeah, I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.